What is up, everybody? Welcome to the Clark Tank. Obviously, we need to talk about E3. Man, there are a lot of games uh, for you know for many of the companies and platforms. The ratio of indie games is kind of decreasing, and I feel like the Switch is having a pretty strong launch year. Today, we are going to be playing Colony Survival. This one's a bit more surprising that it's in the charts than Oxygen Not Included. It's a Minecrafty looking. I assume you you build these structures and things like that and build out your colony. It is multiplayer. It's just man, it sure looks pretty rough. Like it's not much to look at, but it, it's still in the the Steam Top 50. So you know, I think that says a lot about survival games and colony sim type games and multiplayer games and Minecraft style games. A lot of these things, you know, can you even play this single player? Like, I, I'm sure you can, but will it be much of a game? Are there enemies that attack you? But yeah, it's, oh well, okay, zombies, monsters, there we go. So yeah, we will get to that a little bit later, but a few other things to discuss first. Uh, now, if you guys haven't seen this, Ars Technica put out a pretty interesting article. Some of the takeaways from this article are... People use their Xboxes for, you know, half the time for games, half the time for other stuff, and a very tiny slice for backwards compatibility, which, you know, seemed to surprise people and, and may have, you know, made it make more sense why backwards compatibility is not always a high priority for companies. Like, maybe people kind of are more, are happy to have it, to know that they could go back and play those games, but they don't actually go back and play those games very much. Which makes sense, you know, psychologically. You don't want to lose something. Um, people have a, a strong fear of loss. They fear loss much more than they uh, enjoy the equivalent gain. So knowing that, you know, if I got rid of my 360, I wouldn't be losing anything. Um, that's pretty strong. That's compelling, you know. It, it uh, makes it more likely that people will upgrade to an Xbox One. So <clears throat> I think it makes sense. And when you look at the games that people are playing, it's mostly shooty games, sport games, driving games. Like, are any of these not of those genres? I guess Ark is not really a shooty game. Minecraft's not really a shooty game. Skyrim's not really. Okay, so there are a few. Some of these, like, blockbuster things from other genres. This article just kind of makes me want something like Steam Spy, but for PS4 and, and Xbox One. Uh, and I think it should be possible to make something that would be useful for us using the box lighter method. Because we talked a couple Clark Tanks ago about the fact that the box lighter method for estimating sales actually works for PS4 and Xbox One. So if you take the number of uh, reviews, like the... It's shown on the PlayStation 4 and Xbox One uh, like web pages for a game. It shows the total number of reviews, and if you multiply it on PlayStation 4 by about 50, that seems to be correct for you know the types of sales that uh, people are are seeing for their games. And on Xbox One, it seems to be by you multiply by about 100-ish, um, and you know that was the method. It's called the box lighter method because Mike Boxlighter, who's an indie game developer. Uh, came up with that, and that is how we used to estimate sales on Steam before Steam Spy existed. We could use that same sort of system for uh, PS4 and Xbox One. And yeah, I don't think that it would be, you know, as important to have the historical data the way that there is on Steam Spy. But what I would really like to have is something like what Lars is doing with Steam Profit, is where after a month after a game launches, to be able to see Okay, how many did it sell in that, how many units did it sell in that first month? Um, because that will make sure, you know, we have the information that we need to be able to say, oh, this genre is doing well these days and this one is not doing so well. Um, so if we could, if we had something like that to, uh, you know, keep an eye on what's going on, on on PS4 and Xbox One, then, you know, we could expand, not just be looking at, at Steam all the time on the Clark Tank. So if any uh, intrepid, you know, web dev out there wants to create a scraper or something like that to do it. Please, please do it. It'll make the it'll make the Clark Tank stronger, and all of us, uh, I think, will have a better idea of what's going on on the consoles. Because right now, it feels it feels a bit opaque. Uh, that's for sure. 
Uh, but anyway, moving on next, we need to talk about Steam Direct just a little bit because now it's actually live. So on their blog, they talked about it, uh, you know, they closed Greenlight and that Steam Direct was going to launch on the 13th, uh, which it has. And, you know, the interesting details there, I think, um, when you sign up, so I guess a lot of people have probably signed up now because it's, it's live, but they need you to wait 30 days uh, so that they can check your information and know who they're dealing business with. So there's kind of a 30 day cooling per cooling off period. And then you also need to have a coming soon page for a couple of weeks prior to release. So that may mean that in about a month and a half, we will start to see, you know, a spike. Um, and then we'll see, you know, what uh, the steady the steady state turns out to be. And Valve, they, they posted as well on June 13th when Steam Direct was actually available. They actually listed in this article saying like, they themselves don't really know what's going to happen. Um, you know, there could be fewer releases than during Greenlight uh, because Steam Direct is actually a bit more expensive. Or maybe there will be more, or maybe there will be a spike and then and then a big drop off. Uh, but they're saying that they expect a spike and then drop off to slightly higher than um, the number of releases that we were seeing on Greenlight. And I think it's, I would I would expect uh, a similar a similar result. Yeah, there's one other thing I wanted to talk about before we get to our usual uh, analysis of the Steam Top 50. This happened a few, a month ago, but uh, I forgot to discuss it. It's the fact that Destiny 2 is coming to Battle.net exclusively. So Destiny 2, if you want to play it on PC, it's going to be on Battle.net, which is interesting. Um, uh, collaboration across companies like that. And, you know, I wonder if, uh, if Blizzard, if... If they're planning to, if Activision is planning to do more of that sort of thing, like, are they going to eventually allow other smaller companies, indies, and things like that to be on Battle.net as well? Because you know, if if uh, if anyone could create, you know, good tools and things like that for for releasing uh, games on PC and have a good storefront and things like that, it would be it would be Blizzard. So. You know, maybe a harbinger of things to come. Maybe it's a one-off, but it's uh, something that we should definitely pay attention to. Yeah, maybe they're only going to do it for, you know, big blockbuster games like Destiny 2. And maybe the, the, the Destiny team um, just didn't want to, you know, have the hassle of maintaining their own back end for it. And obviously Battle.net already has a fairly robust system in place. So let us get to our homework and check out what is going on on the Steam Top 50. Uh, so yeah, the Steam Top 50 this... Clark Tank it should be interesting because, you know, because of E3, not a ton of new games launched. So are there going to be new things in the charts? Well, we know at least that there is Colony Survival, but is there going to be anything else? Let's find out. So Player Unknown's Battlegrounds had a, a decent amount of hype during E3 um, because it is coming to Xbox One. I don't think that they mentioned that it's coming to PlayStation at all, did they? Now CSGO, hey, is this a new logo? A new icon here? Uh, but yeah, not surprising to see it at number two. And Dota, uh, Dying Light, the following Enhanced Edition. This must be up here because it was on sale or something like that. It's just starting to dip there, so maybe the sale just ended. Uh, H1Z1 King of the Kill is perennial. Did they have an update? Because, yeah, it looks like they jumped up a bit. Yeah, they weren't this high. Last Clark Tank. <clears throat> uh, Call of Duty... Oh, so this is a new Call of Duty DLC that came out just today. Zombies Chronicles. Okay. But yeah, Call of Duty Black Ops is uh, is fairly perennial, so not too surprising to see its DLC in the charts. Now, Arma. Arma's on three uh, on sale, so there's going to be um, some Arma spam in the charts, I expect, with all of its DLCs. So, Arma 3 Karts. Is this like, like a Mario Kart kind of game in Arma 3? What is that even? Isn't a new Call of Duty DLC? It's a PS4 exclusive finally launching for PC. Ah, thank you for that info, Eclipsed. All right, Armor 3 spam, uh, Wolfenstein. So they got this on sale, but there's also a lot of people talking about Wolfenstein since uh, it was, you know, new stuff was shown at E3. More Armor 3 spam. Now the fact that GTA is up so high, number 13, I think that's indicative that it's kind of a slow week when, when there's a lot going on, GTA gets pushed down, and when there's not so much going on, it moves up. And I think that it's not because it's changing in the number of sales, it is the constant, and the other things are the, the variables. So, um, you know, that, that just shows you that this chart is not always like, 
the number 10 seller is not always making the same amount every week. It, uh, it depends on, you know, if there are other things above it that are pushing it down. GTA 5 has blown up in popularity because of the RP mod taking over Twitch. Oh, okay. Well, I could be wrong then. Maybe it's, maybe it's actually legitimately increasing in sales. All right, so GTA, maybe this is up higher because of the roleplay mod? That's interesting. Take-Two said modding is illegal for GTA 5. How, is it possible to even say that it's illegal if you bought it? You can't mess with it? I don't know if that's even possible that that could be illegal. Uh, Final Fantasy XIV Stormblood, okay, this is what Eclipse was talking about. It's not out yet, but people are playing it already, right? Oh, it has an unknown... So, since it hasn't actually launched yet, then we can't see the uh, the user rating. That's interesting. Because, like, there, there seem to be more and more games these days where the launch date is off in the future somewhere, but people are already playing it through various mechanisms. Like, is, does this one have different tiers where you can buy it and then get it access immediately? Yeah, so if you pre-purchase, you get it now. Uh, so, yeah, that's, that's an interesting thing. You can kind of dodge having review scores. So if what Eclipse is talking about uh, is true, that the game has problems and that you can't, you have to wait in line to do quests and stuff like that, players won't know that because you can't see the reviews yet. It's kind of a way of, of gaming the system. If you've got if you've got a game that's not that great, then people won't be able to see the negative reaction to it if there is any. Huh? That's interesting. GTA 5 is getting a massive backlash because they shut down a mod tool. Yeah, why would they do that? Why do people do these things? Why do you not want people modding your game? Especially if it's increasing your sales and stuff. Oh, oh, big AAA companies. They, they have uh, strange motivations sometimes. All right, Black Desert Online. This was in the charts the last, uh, last few weeks, and it's, uh, it's doing well. Uh, Rocket League is perennial. XCOM, were you on sale or something? Why are you here, XCOM 2? Uh, GTA 5 Open IV enables recent malicious mods that allow harassment of players and interfere with GTA Online experience. Oh, I see. Figuring out how to continue to support a creative community without negatively impacting our players. Ah, that makes more sense. So yeah, if it's if it's modding your single player content and letting you have fun on your own, yeah, I cannot understand why they would want to discourage that. But if it if it's messing with multi like online gameplay, then yes, I can see why that would uh, that would concern them. XCOM 2 DLC was featured at E3 on the PC gaming stage. So this is just E3 hype spilling over. XCOM 2 was on sale. Many buys because DLC... Oh, and people were playing it while it was on sale. Okay, so this is residue from it being on sale then. Thank you for that info, guys. All right, Hearts of Iron used to be perennially in the charts uh, last year. And now it's back up because it's on sale. More Wolfenstein stuff, so... I guess because they made that Wolfenstein annou announcement, they decided to put all the old Wolfenstein games on sale and get some spike out of that. Uh, Tekken 7, hanging on. It uh, launched you know, around the time of last Clark Tank. Ori. Now, they announced some Ori thing at E3 too, didn't they? I missed exactly what that was about. But uh, again, people capitalizing on their announcements to put older games on sale. Doing well. Friday the 13th, still selling well. I mentioned uh, it last time that it's the... You should watch the trailer. Unless they've changed it, it seems pretty gruesome. But that's the type of that's the type of content that sells well on on uh, on Steam these days. Yeah, was it an Ori sequel that they announced? The Warframe is perennial and doing well these days. Dead by Daylight's up here because it's on sale. Hearts of Iron Four DLC. Ah, okay. Just came out, and Hearts of Iron the base game is on sale. So not surprising to see that in the charts. Rainbow Six Siege is perennial. TF2 is usually around here somewhere. King of Fighters 14 Steam Edition. So this just came out uh, yesterday. Uh, Total War Warhammer 2. Wow. Coming out in September. And it's already in the charts. That is some No Man's Sky level uh, pre-ordering going on there. there. There was... Okay, Elder Scrolls Online DLC. This has been in the charts for a little while. Uh, another game I could have played, Pro Cycling Manager, but I decided against playing that. I'm not sure how much we would, uh, as indies, would learn from it. Moving on, Space Hulk Deathwing uh, must have been on sale. Looks like it's dropping off now. War Thunder has been in the charts. Look, it's got a kind of a... It looks like it's got a time zone surge. There's certain parts of the world that play it more than others. Uh, EU4 is on sale. Rust is perennial. U4... Okay, U4 is on sale because it has yet another DLC. That game has so many DLCs. 
Final Fantasy XIV. Hmm. Is this just getting uh, a bump because of the other Final Fantasy game? Now, Pathfinder Adventures. This is another one that uh, we could have played. And yeah, card games seem to do reasonably well these days. Dead Cells still hanging around. Colony Survival, which we're going to be playing. Elf and Drow names. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Ark hanging around. It's perennial. Now, Oxygen Not Included still doing well since its launch. Hanging out around there with RimWorld. <clears throat> uh, Path of Exile. It's uh, it's often in the charts these days. And Paladins as well. Fallout 4, why are you here? When did they drop the price to 30 bucks? Uh, so EU4, this is a different expansion that is also on sale. I guess all of its DLCs are on sale. So uh, more Arma stuff. Near uh, Elder Scrolls Online Plus membership. I think this was in the charts last time as well. Skyrim Special Edition. There's Gary's Mod. Gary's Mod. Man, Gary's Mod's been in the charts the last couple of uh, Clark Tanks. I wonder if that's also an indication that, you know, the there hasn't been much new stuff that's, you know, doing extremely well above it, causing it to be pushed down. Or if just for some reason it's having a bit of a resurgence. But all right, Killing Floor 2 is on sale. Cold Waters. So this is another one that came out recently. Uh, I considered playing because I do think we could learn from this. It just seems kind of it seems kind of sparse to me, this game. Uh, you know, maybe there's a, a great deal of depth below the surface. And like like that explosion kind of didn't move along with the ship. <laughs> I think there there is a market for strategy gamers, you know, especially like core war gamers. Uh, they are quite willing to pay, you know, 40, 50, 60 bucks, whatever, for a game that they are interested in. Pushing it as Red Storm Rising 2 is smart. Yeah, actually, that's a good point. Uh, we should discuss that. Look, can you actually do this? Spiritual successor to the Microprose, <laughs> Microprose classic Red Storm Rising. Can you say that? Can they not sue you for that? Using their trademark to promote your game? And like, that's the only thing that they say. You remember that other game? It's like that. <laughs> and it works, I guess. All right, moving on. Uh, MotoGP, so this just came out. So uh, a racy, racy game. Smite is perennial. Jazz Punk, that's cool that it's in the charts because it's on sale. Mobius Final Fantasy, so Anything to do with Final Fantasy is getting a bump right now. Planet Coaster is reasonably perennial. Wow, there's a lot of stuff beyond 50 here. Oh, there's hidden, folks. It was hiding down here. Uh, more Elder Scrolls stuff. This is Rising Storm Vietnam, which has been hanging around since its launch a couple weeks ago. And there is Hidden Folks by Adrian Dijong, my pal. Let's watch it. If you guys are not aware of this game, you need to check it out. It's super fun. And yeah, honestly, Adrian, I'm surprised that it did so well on Steam. It's hard to estimate how well this game would do because there are not very many games like it. Like, there's nothing like it on Steam, right? So, so there is no prior art to compare to. So yeah, I honestly had no idea. But yeah, you should, you guys should check it out. It is super fun. And yeah, I, I've talked before about um, things like this that are hard to predict. Uh, like, when you're playing Steam Profit, when you're playing Lars' Steam Profit game, when you're trying to predict, like, which games are going to sell well, I don't think that you should ever beat yourself up when there's a game like Hidden Folks or that game Ravenfield, um, which which kind of do really well when you didn't expect it. I think the thing that you should be trying to do, you know, with the Clark Tank and with Steam Profit is to be confident that when you say this is going to be a hit, that you're correct. So when you're making video games uh, as an indie developer, you are betting the farm on, you know, one game. You're betting, you know, a year or more of your life and, you know, money on this game. And so you want to be confident that when you choose something, that you're right, that it's going to do well, that it's, you know, going to be profitable and you'll be able to continue making a living. Um, so I think being concerned that when you miss something like Hidden Folks or, or Undertale, if you're like, I wouldn't have predicted that that had done so well. Um, obviously, it would have been nice to be able to predict those things, but it's hard because there there isn't any information that you could have you know there there isn't a genre that you could have looked at to have made you know an informed decision about that so using the sort of system that i do where you you look at the types of games that are selling well the genres that are selling well find one that you are interested in and have an innovative unique idea for and you know a game design that you're going to be 
really excited to make and your team is excited to make and and that you think you can create a game that will stand out because of its gameplay and its art and its music and all that stuff if you have all those criteria together then you can be fairly confident that you will make a game that will be that will be profitable um, and that's the sort of prediction you want to be sure about you don't need to be able to call the success of all games so when a, a game like hidden folks comes up and surprises you don't allow that to undermine your you know your confidence in your abilities to to estimate so what you want to do is whenever you say that game i'm sure that one's going to do well like i was saying with oxygen not included before that came out i'm like yeah that one gonna do really well and if it hadn't then i would be having a crisis and i would be very concerned about my ability to predict these sorts of things um so yeah hidden folks surprising that it's doing so well on steam i expected it to do well on ios because it's a very like you know touchy kind of game um, I just did not know that there would be, you know, an, an audience for it on Steam since Steam tends to be so much more of a core, core gamer audience. But yeah, uh, 90, 99% positive. That's awesome, Adrian. Congrats, man. And the Daily Deal is doing bizarre things to your sales. <laughs> bizarre good things, I hope. Yeah, well, the fact that you're in the charts, it's very good. But yeah, congrats, Adrian. I'm very happy for you. And it is such, a, such an awesome, well-made game. Vega Conflict, yeah, we've seen this pop up into the charts every now and then. Miscreated. Two Worlds, uh, what game does this belong to? We'll have to check it out. Dirt 4. Okay, so this just came out recently and it's already dropping down the charts. And Civ 6 has been perennial for quite a while. Alright, let's see what the heck this Call of the Tenebrae. The base game Two Worlds, oh, okay, yeah, we talked about Two Worlds a while ago. Alright, that makes sense. But now it is time to play and learn from Colony Survival. Let me fire that up. Okay, Colony Survival. Why are you selling so well? Let's find out. Alright, we are... This is first person. Why is it first person? Are we one of the colonists? So we're supposed to place the banner somewhere, right? Alright, let's go in the middle of this flat area and try to remember how to place this flag thing. Alright, it says in the top left we got no colonists. Well, that's not a flag. We're gonna probably die here, right? Let's try to make a wall. Colony management. Colonists require five food, food, food units per day and a bed. Recruiting a colonist costs 50 food units. Okay, let's get one. Got one. Do that. I, I don't know if that worked or not. I, I let go of the right click. No, it's still there. You have to right click again. All right, dude, do your job. Now we need to figure out how to get straw, which I guess we just need wheat for. So we just need to like wait for two days. Okay, well, let's, let's do some mining, I suppose. Ah, wrong button. How far down do we have to freaking go here? Or is this the stuff that we need that we're already getting here? Oh, is this it? What is this? So this is the end of the world. Whoa, what's that? It's all very confusing. Work pinch, go. That's a work pinch? It's not a crate. That's a crate. That's a workbench. Two beds. Do they care that they're beside each other? There. We got a dude. Oh, he's going to bed too. We have to put another bed? We just have to keep putting beds? Oh, you can click it repeatedly. Oh jeez. Oh no. Right. You doing it? Yay. Oh, we have our own bow. Can't use bow, no arrows in inventory. Oh, so we can actually defend too. Saplings. 
we can place saplings. Aha, we can shoot. All right, now we can defend. All right, well, we can make like a a death spiral for these bad guys to have to follow. Got him. All right, we understand this game now. Yay. Yeah, well, okay, I guess my conclusion would be that this obviously appeals to the Minecraft crowd, and I think it's selling well just because those streamers are playing it. Like, those those people who stream and YouTube Minecraft, as I said earlier, many of them have been streaming it and YouTubing it for years and years and years, and it's difficult for them to be able to branch out from it because their core audience won't watch if they play other games that are not like Minecraft. But maybe this one is similar enough that they can get away with it and their audience will still come, at least a higher percentage of their audience and they get to have a new gameplay experience. So I'm sure that it's a lot more fun for them than having to play the game that they've been playing for, you know, four years or however long they've been doing it. So, you know, I don't think that this game is, is great. I think you would probably get to the the point where you're like, all right, I've, I've done all the things that there are to do <clears throat> before too long. I guess we'll see on Steam what the average playtime ends up being. Um, but having this multiplayer also, you know, doing it with your friends would be fun. Uh, I think this type of game could get better if you have larger and larger challenges and, you know, a tech tree that you can work through. Like if eventually you get to trolls that'll smash your walls and things like that and you need to make catapults to be able to defend against them. And, you know, that's kind of what I wanted with Dwarf Fortress was like a an ever escalating um, attack so that I had to keep escalating, you know, my, my defense and um, always felt like I was under pressure. Uh, that's sort of what I, I wanted from that in the in the end game. Um, so yeah, this is early access. Maybe they'll maybe they'll add those sorts of things and and give it the longevity that uh, that I'm talking about. That could be good. You know, the graphics and and whatnot are not amazing, but they suffice. The graphics in Minecraft are not amazing either, but they they're good enough for the gameplay. I think that's my conclusion from uh, playing Colony Survival. But yeah, I think that wraps it up for this Clark Tank. Uh, and yeah, thanks for watching as usual. But for now, this Clark Tank is over. See you next time.